I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the auto tune. So we were lucky in, in our case, uh, we had our uh, auto tune complete successfully. We didn't have any errors. However, th there is an opportunity for, for an error to pop up. The most common error um, that, you, that you're probably going to see is going to be an ECDD, error calculating motor data. Uh, what that's going to uh, basically tell you is that uh, there's probably an error in the motor data that you entered. Um, so again, that's where you would go through, double check, make sure that the number of motor poles uh, remains constant if the, uh, if, if the data was, was scaled. Um, you might get an um, error encoder 1 fault if you have an induction uh, machine. Uh, that would be due to you missing the, the channel pairs on the, on the encoder. So there are a few things that, that you may get. Um, you also may get a controller error. You might get a um, drive enable switch off event. Uh, that, that will show up. And uh, again, the auto tune, if you drop the enable, will stop right there. Um, so check the controller, make sure that's not faulting at all. All right, so you've done the encoder learn, you've done the motor learn, and um, now you want to enter in the, the machine data. Um, so this is where you're going to enter in the, the shiv diameter, gear reduction ratio if you have a, a geared machine. A few things to, to note here. Uh, if you're using serial speed control, the controller is going to be writing a direct RPM value to the drive. So actually the machine data isn't going to affect uh, the speed of the car. However, if you are using, say, digital or binary speed control, where the drive is in charge of the profile, uh, changing your shift diameter, gear reduction ratio, that's going to change your, your speed. Check to make sure you're going the correct speed. Run the car on inspection. Look at that command speed. Look at the um, motor speed, the feedback coming back from the encoder. Make sure those two are, are close. Um, if they are off, if they're off by a factor, you may have to adjust your, your shift diameter or gear reduction ratio. We also have this equation that you can use if you're wondering, is my car or is my motor rotating at the correct RPM for what uh, a foot per minute uh, speed I'm, I'm wishing to go? You can use this equation here. All it is is the 12 times the gear ratio times your roping ratio times what you're trying to go in feet per minute divided by the shift diameter times uh, 3.14. So if you don't have a tack, um, this should tell you uh, pretty close to what, what your motor should be rotating at for a corresponding foot per minute speed. Uh, overspeed, so we did see, see that come up here. Uh, that is calculated at 110% of the uh, contract speed. So make sure that USO6 is set correctly. Um, sometimes you may have to adjust the, the gain settings if you're getting it during uh, rolling over into contract speed from, from your XL portion of the profile. If you're getting it at the start of the run right away, it's most likely due to something on the, the encoder side. Overspeed test. So we actually do, there, there are a number of, of things you, you can do on the drive, but uh, we actually do uh, have a, a tune parameter that is set just for the, the governor overspeed test. Uh, what that allows you to do is um, you don't have to change any of the parameters. So like if you're running digital speed or binary speed control, if you change the, the gear reduction ratio a little bit to, to trick your drive into running a little bit faster, uh, you wouldn't have to, to do that. So what you can do is you would go to, to LL15 under the, the tune parameters, and uh, you can actually uh, start an overspeed test. What that will do is it'll automatically bypass that 110% threshold in the drive. That will uh, it'll allow you to, to actually overspeed the car for, uh, for one run. We actually have two different options for the overspeed test. Uh, we have a start with scaling option and a start without scaling option. Uh, this is used to, um, this is going to be controller dependent, but um, this basically just allows you to uh, either set a desired speed at which you'd like to overspeed at, um, or you could actually change the speed manually in the controller. So if you choose the start with scaling option, uh, you would set the speed in the drive for what you would wish to overspeed at, and the drive will automatically scale uh, the incoming controller speed. So you don't have to make any adjustments on the controller. All you have to do is say, okay, you know, my contract speed is 500 feet per minute, 
I want to overspeed at 575 or 600. You'd set that, the drive will automatically scale that uh, contract speed of 500 foot per minute coming over from the controller, and your governor should trip. Anybody have any questions on the overspeed test? A lot of this uh, depends, it, you get the answer, uh, it depends. Um, some of the uh, instructions will have you change settings in the drive, some will not. So uh, yes, like, like you said, David, follow that procedure because if it is not followed and something goes wrong, then you're exactly right. It's going to be on, um, on whoever the party at fault was. OK, uh, a few notes um, on the speed, on the speeds. So uh, when we were adjusting the, the demos up here, uh, we had to change the, the high speed. So no matter what, what type of speed control you are using, high speed will have to be set. Um, that, if that is not set, you will not be able to, to run. We do have a, a variety of speeds uh, that you can set. Most of them are just going to be different terminology. We've got a few intermediate speeds uh, that can kind of be used as either an emergency uh, or an ETS, something like that. Again, that's going to depend upon the controller and what, what they want you to, to set. Uh, so the, the encoder learn, uh, we, we went through this as well. You know, one, one thing I do just want to point out, LE05, that encoder multiplier factor, uh, that's going to give you a little bit more uh, resolution on, on the encoder side. Um, again, for the induction machines, a uh, default of va value of 2 is going to be used. And for the end at machines, a uh, default value of, of 8 will be used. The differences between the, the TTL and the end at encoders. So the TTL signal is going to be a, a square wave. And uh, if you notice that they're between the A and B channels, they are a little bit offset here. So that's where that voltage differential is coming in here. Uh, you compare that to the end at, it's actually a sine wave coming back. Again, it's going to be um, shifted. The resolution multiplier, where, where that comes into effect. So the resolution multiplier, uh, that's going to, especially for the permanent magnet uh, application, give you much more uh, re resolution. Uh, I'll, I'll do for an example, if you have a 1024 uh, incremental encoder, that multiplier factor of 2 will be used. Um, we multiply it by 2 raised to the 2. So that will give you a total resolution of 4096 counts compared to just a typical 1024. So we actually have more counts per revolution. Compare that to the end at, and we have 2048, and we're going to take 2. We're going to raise it to the eighth. So that's that multiplier factor. Now total resolu resolution is going to be 524,288. So compared to a TTL, that's 128 times the resolution factor. So again, back to, to David's point about you know, how much the, the tolerances that are involved on these permanent magnet machines, we need that. Um, that's as far as running, because of the tight tolerances, we need that much resolution. A few, few things that could happen during the SPI. Has anybody run into any issues during the SPI? Have they got it where it failed? Yes, Dan has. What, what, uh, what did it give you? It ended up having to learn it another way and then go back because it already had learned one from the factory. And it okay. wasn't the same one that I had. OK. Um, so yes, um, there there are a few things that, that can happen. Um, you might get a ECDD, the error calculate motor data. You might think, why would I get that during the, the SPI? I'm not, I already did the auto tune. That's going to come back to the, the drive actually uses the, the motor model to, to calculate the uh, encoder position. So the encoder position is, uses the motor inductance uh, in, in the calculation. So if you've got bad motor data to start out, it's not going to be able to calculate the correct encoder position. So again, motor data, that's something to check. It also, uh, depending upon motor type that you have, um, some of the motors, just the way that they're designed and the materials they use, will ultimately feature a higher inductance. Um, with a higher inductance, if you go in the background of the drive, it actually has a harder time uh, measuring the position of the encoder. And um, it might actually give you an error saying that um, it could not calculate the, the position. The counts were, were varying too much. Um, 
So in, in that case, it might uh, say, try another method. That other method is going to be the plearn, the pollearn. Um, that will do the, the same as the SPI. However, it needs to be done with no ropes on the shiv or a balance car. Uh, one note with the uh, polearn. One nice thing with, with the polearn is that it actually automatically calculates the correct AB channel phasing for you. Uh, you don't have to go through and um, you know, manually select uh, or, or try to run and see if you're on the correct channel. The polearn automatically does that for you. Uh, it will tell you that you're on the wrong channel. It will make the change by itself, but it's up to you to do another SPI. Anytime you switch from a not inverted channel to an AB swapped, so if you're going to that, that AB swapped setting, you need to do another SPI. Uh, the SPI, um, the position values are going to be different for, for each channel. Um, so other than startup, um, you would, when would you have to do another SPI? Anytime the encoder's been taken off or moved. Uh, even if somebody bumped it, if they're moving you know, something in and they just bumped it and it was running before, you might have to do another one. Um, the encoder position, the mounting, is absolutely critical for proper operation of the, of the permanent magnet motors. Yeah, so once the um, correct position has been learned um, and the motor is running, there's, there's no need to, to change anything or to, to mess with it. That goes for both uh, mounting of the encoder and uh, switching the channel phasing as well. David. So the question was, is what do you do if you can't, uh, you're trying to do the SPI and um, it, it's giving you an error, it wants you to use the, the pole learn uh, method and you don't have weights on site, you can't get weights into the car, what are you supposed to do? How, how can you find the correct uh, encoder position? Uh, there's actually two other methods. Um, the first method, uh, it's a little bit more involved. It actually involves us going into the encoder data and using a, um, changing a few parameters to, instead of taking a, a, a whole procedure and taking a bunch of different values, is what it'll do is it'll just do one at a time. So is what we'll do is we'll change the, it's called rotor detection mode. And instead of changing it to um, uh, every single run, we'll just do once per run. And is what that will do is you'll give it the enable signal. We'll be able to tell the position. We'll write it down. We'll do it again. Write that position down. We'll do it 10 or so times, take an average. That's one way. And the really, the, and if we're still having issues from, from that point, one final way to do it is to, to guess and check. Um, you, you're going to have a position anywhere from 0 to 65,535 counts. So what you can do, if you just divide that up by 4, you can kind of start incrementing um, different, different count values. Uh, you can enter that into the, the encoder position parameter. So what you do is you just start in values of around 4,000 counts. And uh, so start at 4,000, try to run the car. Does it move? Uh, if it doesn't, add another 4,000. Yes, so um, actually I, what I should say is initial adjustments, you can start making it around 16,000. That should get you in the right quadrant. And then from there you can start making smaller and smaller adjustments. Um, like you said, David, it's going to take about an hour. Uh, it is possible. You can do it. It's really a last resort option, but uh, eventually you will get to a point where you move. It's not going to sound pretty. You're probably going to draw high current, but at least you know you're in the right, right area. Now, in our example up here, we ended up not doing this procedure uh, just because of, a, of, of time and, and everything. So what, what does the, the encoder synchronization do? All that's going to do is, is uh, select the, the correct channel for you. If you're unsure, if you're on the right channel, you can do the, the encoder synchronization. Um, again, sometimes this causes some confusion. If you're at the top of the hoist way, it's going to ask you to run up. You run down, and then the drive is going to ask you, did the car run up? Well, you ran the car down, so you say no. Um, and then is what happens is, is it changes the channels for you automatically, and then you try to run again, and it doesn't work. 
again, if you're at the middle of the hoistway or if you're at the bottom, this works great. Uh, we're actually changing uh, the terminology on here to ask you to run the car down just because in almost every application the car is at the top of the hoistway uh, in this situation. And uh, so what it'll do is it'll ask you to run the car down and then it'll ask you did the car go the correct direction. Uh, if you command it down and the car went up, uh, all that needs to be changed is the, the actual direction. If you tried to run down and the car didn't move at all or it jerked and you got an overspeed error, it's likely that you're on the wrong, wrong channel phasing. So once, once the um, motor has the, the learn has been done, the encoder learn has been done, uh, you're pretty confident that, that everything is set correctly, you can go ahead and try to run on inspection. Uh, again, that's kind of what we did up here. You know, we looked at the command speed, looked at the motor speed, make sure they're, they're close. Um, look at the current, make sure that's uh, below rated. Again, if it's higher than rated, we probably have a, an issue with the, either the motor, motor data or the encoder data for a permanent magnet motor. And again, if you've got the induction machine, you can put it in open loop. That'll tell you if it's drive related or not. And then if everything looks good on inspection speed and you're confident uh, with everything, you can move on to, to running high speed. A few notes here. You may have to increase the maximum torque of the, of the drive. Um, maximum torque default value is going to be at 150% of the rated. Uh, you're probably going to have to change it to 200 to 250% to pick the full load. Um, that's normal. That's fine. Are you going to cause damage to the drive? No. Ultimately, the, the drive is current protected. If you're drawing too much current, you should get a, an overcurrent error. Inertia learn using the feed forward torque control. Anybody here have experience with that other than Dan? The inertia learn is not required. It's something that you don't have to do. Uh, what is it going to do for you? Uh, it's going to make your ride quality uh, a lot better, a lot, a lot more responsive. Uh, if you've got some pretty tight uh, floor to floor times that you need to meet, uh, activating the inertia can, can definitely help you in that, that area. Uh, I've got a few slides later on that kind of go through um, specifically what the inertial learn does um, and it kind of tells you, uh, I've got a graph actually that'll show you what a, a detuned motor and what a, a tuned motor with the inertial learn active, what that does from a, a ride quality standpoint. But uh, for now, we'll just kind of go through how you would do it. Uh, you're just going to, you're going to balance the car. Uh, again, as long as it's close, um, that's fine. But uh, it is done with a, a balanced load. And then um, you, you will go to the, the tune parameters. And uh, much like the motor learn and the, the encoder learn, you'll select to, to do the inertial learn. And uh, the, the drive is going to ask you to run the car up. It's going to ask you to run the car down. It's going to have you do that a few times. And uh, what it's going to do is take an average of the, the acceleration torque uh, values that are, that are required. To, to get you up to speed. When that happens, the, the acceleration torque is going to be calculated, and then the system inertia will automatically be calculated. So the drive will automatically calculate the system inertia based on the acceleration torque value that it, that it measured. So there's no need to, to do any calculations there. Uh, once you do the inertia learn, uh, feed forward torque control will be active. Um, you don't have to, to turn it on or anything like that. It will will be active. Um, there are a few other uh, parameter settings that, that you can adjust in, in feed forward torque control if you wish. Again, we'll, when we talk about ride quality, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about those. But for the most part, um, you're going to have a more responsive uh, ride, so you may have to, to change some of the gain settings a little bit. We actually do have a, a low pass torque filter that you can also adjust.